Well, hello everyone. It's Ren here. Good to see you guys. Happy Sunday. It's once again a beautiful Sunday today here. So hopefully energizing for this video. Now we're going to take a slightly different route from the one that we've been taking in the last few episodes where I've, just, I've, I've been focused on discussing various traits of INFJs in the context of uh, so the, the intellectual world, the emotional world, the political world. And in this video, I want to return to something maybe a little bit more substantial, although I do not want to argue that what I was discussing before was not substantial. But in this video, I'm going to try to tackle something potentially the most ambitious video I've ever, ever released, intellectually speaking anyway. So we'll see how it goes. There's two goals to this video. Number one, to give you a sense of how NI functions at this intellectual level. Uh, because I talked about those three traits, the, the high level, big picture dimension of NI. So, you know, that that was the kind of the first trait. Uh, I talked about the fact that NI tended to see constant underneath change. So that was the, that was the, uh, the second um, big kind of aspect. And then the, the, the third aspect was that uh, in general, INFJs need time to kind of set all of this in motion because it focuses on the holistic picture. It takes more time than maybe uh, an lead or an SED would to, to kind of intellectually deploy itself. But I want to do this by looking at the history of thought, <laughs> at the history of Western thought. So to show you how like there's something very temporal in the way that NI connects past, present, and future in this kind of continuous sequence, um, I I want to illustrate that, you know, and and also that it needs time, that there is some sometimes a little bit of rambling, hopefully not too much of it, and that is looking for constants. Um, you know, I, I you know, let's try to see if I can illustrate this by talking about the history of how we look at the world, right? In the West, I don't want to go beyond that because I feel less, I feel I have a lot less expertise. Um, so the history of how we look in the world, at the world, how we conceive of ourselves uh, in the West um, is what I'm going to talk about today. And like I said, that's the second dimension of the video is to have this more historical, philosophical perspective. And once I've said this, maybe we can get started. So um, before we get started, actually, just remember that we can get my book on the INFJ, The Ecstatic Soul, less than $10, bestseller now on Amazon at its level, and my new novel, The Infinite Castle. Very nice product. Okay, you can also get it down below for less than $10 at the links to Amazon. All right, so let's get started. Um, the history of Western thought is often uh, dated to you know, in relation to literary sources, because that's kind of what we can start with, uh, with obviously various numbers of scriptures, but also the writing of the Greek Homer. And I think what is important to understand when we look at these earlier periods is that one of the immediate dangers that presents itself to us from our perspective nowadays in the 21st century is an anachronism, right? It's the fact that we could be tempted to look back and 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 interpret the the writings, the actions, the doings, and the sayings of big, you know, players at the time uh, through the lens of a worldview, which is our worldview, uh, which is not actually fit to parse and judge worldviews at the time in some ways because it belongs to a totally different era. Okay. Um, and that's a risk that presents itself to any philosopher, to any historian, and uh, it's certainly going to present itself to me in this video, but, you know, I ask you to be uh, charitable with me, because slippage is probably likely to happen. But the thing I want to say about the, you know, the early classical periods, you know, the, the period um, before the flourishing of, the, of, of the, the Greeks, the Greek philosophers, as we know them, from Thales to Pythagoras to Plato to Aristotle to Stoicism to Cynicism to Epicureanism, you know, a massive flourishing of Greek thought, which will be eventually influential. Before that, you had this uh, pre, if you like, these, these pre-Greek 
uh, rational Greek thought, which we can best describe best describe as mythical, myth mythical thought. And that's what you see in the writings of Homer, and that's what you see to an even larger extent in the hypotheses that um, most social scientists, historians, and ethnolo ethnologists have. And you see this in Neon too, by the way, when he talks about tribes, historio tribes, uh, before Homer and uh, in more primitive societies where the relationship to the world is often described as concretistic. In other words, there's not uh, if you like at the fundamental level, a set separation between yourself and the world, right? This is something that we take for granted nowadays. I am myself, I relate to the world. I am a subject relating to other subjects and to a lot of different objects. And in some sense, I am a self relating to a wider world. And with this comes questions uh, that we sometimes refer to as skeptical questions. Is it possible that I am in a matrix uh, or it could be solipsistic questions. Uh, is it possible, you know, or along the skeptical lines, is it possible that actually I don't know anything about what's going on, everything, but this is kind of unthinkable, you know, to people at the time. Uh, people, when they ask themselves these questions, you, know, you see, you hear Elon Musk sometimes uh, asking himself that question, or people making business, business sort of profitable, profitable business of that question. It's kind of funny to think that if we avoid the an anachronism, um, that question was literally unthinkable at the time that I'm thinking about. In fact, it was still unthinkable at the time of the rational Greeks, as I call them, the pre-Socratics and the Socratics, and the post-Socratics, I mean. Um, but even more so in the myth mythological period where the concretistic dimension of that quote-unquote earlier primitive thought was that you were an integral organic part of the order of the world, right? You, of course, you had emotions, you had relationships with, to others, but you, did, you didn't think of yourself as an independent subject, possessing certain traits and feelings and emotions that were completely your, your own and relating to objects in an, instrument, in an instrumental way in which we would know it is. So Jung is always talking about how tribes tend to and how objects with all sorts of magical powers. It's not, again, to be misleadingly applied anachronistically by thinking, oh, you know, they were kind of mad. They just thought they saw a tree and they thought they had powers. That's because whenever they felt a particular emotion or a particular kind of experience toward a tree or toward a, a totem, or that complex of emotions was actually concretized into the relationship that you had with the tree itself. It's very hard to kind of completely appreciate, but that's part of the what's called the, the mythological viewpoints that was very much present in Homer at the time, also in a more subtle and more kind of illiterate fashion. With that also comes a particular form of, um, again, not to be called morality as such, but maybe a, a concept of the good life, what, what, what it meant to have a good life. It's obviously very different from what we would have nowadays. Um, the good life was just you know, for those who had time to think about it, and, and there were not many, uh, was conceived in terms of having your proper place in the world, having your proper place in the order of being. Um, and as it became more refined, you know, in the in the Homeric tradition, it was also conceived in terms of, you know, the, the best people having the, the attributes that were the most likely to embody the height and natural forces, so power and glory and and <clears throat> nobility, were conceived through this concreti concretistic lens. You know, and it was like the the concept of of benevolence towards others or charity. You know, was was not well, it's it's that's something of an invention of a later time, and in fact, that's why Nietzsche, who hated those traits you know, of Christianity, and they, he thought they were embodiments of the will to nothingness of and of course sentiment wanted to go back to something more ancient Greek in this sense. Now, when we get to the pre-Socratics uh, and then the post-Socratics, Plato and Aristotle, one big change I think that we want to emphasize is there was still this notion of cosmic order, but there is a massive emphasis that's now put on this a concept of what we might call, and again, it might be a little bit anachronistic, but not too anachronistic, reason. Um, the concept of rationality and reason. 
uh, is very, very important to that period and an innovation as, re uh, as relating to the earlier sort of pre-rational mythological period. The age of the pre-Socratics and of Plato and of the followers of Plato and different schools that sprawled afterwards in lots of different ways that I'm not going to be able to tackle in this video because it would take too long, really started to think in terms of the ability of the human being to reflect and to attain a view of the world, a view of the cosmic order that in itself reflected the order of the universe. So when this tradition thinks about the soul, I mean, because the concept of soul originates from this, the soul in every human is in, well, it has different signification in Aristotle, who elaborates on different parts of the soul. But if we want, we were to encapsulate it, the soul is, 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 is the, the kind of mirror in every human that is capable of orienting itself to the same symmetrical order that the world possesses. And the good life is the life that is a life of harmony between the order in your soul and the order in the universe. So Plato would talk about the idea of the good as the idea of this perfect order and of the ability that we have of having the idea of the good instantiated with, within us by having well-ordered souls. What's important to appreciate though is that in the case of the rationality of this time, the um, the ability to be rational was an ability that had to do in some sense with being able to view things right in an ability to align your seeing with the right order of the world and if you had the right seeing inside your soul you were rational and if you were rational you had knowledge and if you had knowledge you were acting in a good way where uh as it were you were performing good actions in other words and this is something that socrates is, is often talking about is that if you have right knowledge, if you have true legitimate knowledge as the basis of your action, you cannot act badly, right? There's a link between knowledge and the good very strongly. And it's a derivative of the fact that, that, that the good life is conceived in terms of being able to perceive the right order of the universe and having that reflected in your internal soul, okay? And that's actually kind of crazy when you think about it, because then many centuries later, well, Christianity comes along, and of course there's lots of innovations that Christianity brings with it. But maybe we can zero in on the work of Saint Augustine, right? Who's the one of the most influential writers in the Christian tradition. Some of you will have read the Confessions, and if you're very Christian or very motivated or very into Augustine, you probably have uh, had a look at the City of God and maybe some other writings, his writings on the Trinity, for example. Now, what's innovative in Augustine, and something that, to be honest, carries a lot of intuitive appeal and conviction, even though it's carried to certain lengths that would be considered too extreme nowadays in view in a, in a, in a secularized world. Augustine through Christianity, emphasizes original sin, right? We were not born, uh, because of the actions of Adam and Eve, we were born sinful. Now, it sounds very, you know, that has a very religious ring to it, but why is it innovative in terms of how, of the, the people's view of themselves and their relationship to the world in the Western world, compared to the Greeks and what I just talked about? Well, what's innovative is that <clears throat> through the idea of original sin, Augustine brings into the picture something very important. And this very important picture that he brings is the idea that you could be perfectly rational and still be rotten. In other words, you could still be full of sin. That having knowledge and having rationality does not guarantee that you're going to be a good person. I think that nowadays, complete consensus, look at the Nazis. Nazis had a lot of knowledge. They had a lot of instrumental rationality at their disposal. Now you'd be hard pressed to say that Nazis uh, were good. <laughs> and I'm using this kind of reductio ad absurdum to make the point stuck. Of course, in Augustine, that was all couched in a very kind of religious language. But the essential insight is that rationality 
which in some sense remains an ability to see the world aright. And we'll, we'll understand why this is important to emphasize, because this is going to change in later conceptions of, of rationality and the subject in the history of thought. But this, 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 essentially this ability to see the order of the cosmos reflected in your own soul is not sufficient for Augustine to act well. You still need to have a will that comes on top of it. And the concept of will and willpower is kind of introduced at this stage as well. Right knowledge and true knowledge is not an automatic path to right action. Seems obvious to us. Was not obvious to the Greeks. It is obvious to Augustine, to his concept of sin, and to the, the notion of being able to overcome, to do good works and be graced, and graced of God, and to manage to surpass, in some sense, the, the sinful precondition in order to not only see the world right, but act right within the world. So sin takes the place of this, you know, has the role of this, if you like, this ability that reason has of actually going wrong in terms of morality, which which is true, I think, uh, uh, undeniably. And throughout the entire medieval period, which came to be very influenced by Aristotle more so than Plato, because, you know, Plato was the main influence on Augustine. Aristotle was the main influence on the uh, on the medievals, on scholasticism, particularly on Thomas Aquinas, but on many others. There's differences between these two approaches and how Plato and Neoplatonism in one way and Aristotelianism in another way, and also via Muslim thought, um, influenced Catholic and Christian thought. I'm not going to go into it, but... Again, INFJ and I high level stuff, it still remains preoccupied with what I talked about. The question of right seeing of the world and having a will that is attuned to acting rightly according to this right seeing of the world. And there is also a development of the notion of inwardness, which is important around this time, is because in order to develop your will in such a way that you act rightly, because reason is not enough. You need to be able to observe yourself. And with this concept of being able to introspect and reflect deeply and observe yourself, you see that very much in Augustine, comes the idea of an interiority of the self. And the self becomes something that is already the self and the subject. You can see the outlines of what will become more modern. Okay, it's not completely modern yet, but there's this sense of interiority that develops that was absent at the time of the the so-called primitives, pre-classical, pre-Socratic, post-Socratic. What is the main revolution at that point, post the medieval period? Well, the main revolution is Descartes, René Descartes. You probably have heard of this lad from France who said the famous thing, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. And he said many other things that were very influential. As the philosopher Charles Taylor has emphasized, the, the link between Augustine and Descartes is underestimated. Because this concept of interiority and this concept of being able to direct your reason according to a willpower guided by right action is going to impact Descartes, except that Descartes is going to, to some extent, displace, and in fact, not just to some extent, Descartes ushers in modern philosophy. You might ask yourself, why is he always called the father of modern philosophy? Why are we not calling Kant the father of modern philosophy or Hume or Locke? Why is it Descartes? Well, because Descartes just effects a massive change in relation to an Augustinian viewpoint that otherwise did influence him. He keeps the interiority of the self or the inter interiority of the what will become the self in fact uh and you know when he says cogito er ergo sum the notion of the entirety of the self is is already really burgeoning at this point but the massive difference that he affects is that he moves from a concept of rationality as right seeing to of the world of a world that is otherwise perfectly and cosmically ordered and exhibits mathematical beauty and harmony and so on. It's a word that is full of meaning. That's in Augustine and in the pre-Socratics, okay. 
to a world that is essentially neutral. A world governed by mechanistic relations. Inert. Uh, and rationality, therefore, cannot find itself in the reflection of this world, because this world itself, like, there's nothing rational or not rational to call it. It's a world that we ought to engage in a, in fact, disengaged scientific manner and measure and observe. And so rationality is not about being able to reflect the beauty of something external, the beautiful order of something external, uh, like it's been conceived then at that point for millennia. It then becomes conceived as a procedure, as being able to follow certain steps internally so that you can arrive at the right results in an experiment, in a line of reasoning, in work toward attaining what Descartes calls clear and distinct ideas, which is the source of knowledge. You start from what you can have as clear and distinct ideas internally, and you follow a f almost like a formula, a procedure from these distinct ideas to arrive at other sources of knowledge. Rationality is no longer the reflection in your inside your soul of the external world. Rationality is a procedure that you already have internally and that you can master internally. So with that, in addition to the interiority of the subject that's already inherited from Augustine, rationality becomes something internal. You're starting to get lots of stuff that's internal, and in fact, enough internal traits that is a system that is born, which we will call the subject. So we talk about the Cartesian subject. That's really where, you know, uh, Descartes invents the subject in this sense. And of course, with the invention of the subject, you get the problem of um, dualism. You get the problem of dualism because, well, if I am a subject, what am I? It's not just physical, it has to be something else. What is this thing that has all these funny traits of being able to be rational and all, all that? And so, of course, Descartes has to invent the concept of the thinking substance. I think, therefore, I am. He arrives at the conviction that we can establish that we exist as a thinking substance, but we also have a body. And how can the two interact in this perfect manner? Well, Descartes derives, or this is where he brings in God. God is the being that ensures that this takes place. I mean, of course, he has a more subtle argument. And in some sense, Leibniz is the one who develops the concept of harmony like this. But the important point is that God is no longer the instantiation of this perfect cosmic order. God is rather a piece of an item of reasoning that has to make sense of a dualism that has itself to make, you know, is itself an offshoot of the birth of the subject as internally rational being and an, an ego now that exists. So you can really see that God is still there, but it has been relegated to something that is only part of a process of reasoning. So when people nowadays think, oh, you know, like uh, people are not Christian anymore, people are not religious anymore in the West, and we should return, at least appreciate the fact that the, the, the process of the, the de-Christianization is a very, very long process over millennia, and that Descartes and Locke and Leibniz still very much saw themselves as Christians, but they were not quite realizing that they were taking part in a process that would eventually arrive at secularism and to, in some cases at, at, at atheism. Now, you see that in Kant also. Kant, of course, was very, very religious. Now, he wasn't Catholic, he was Protestant, he was part of the pietistic, pietistic tradition, and Kant had to contend with the fact that Hume, the Scottish philosopher before him and after Descartes, really cast doubt on the entire Cartesian earned enterprise. And if I were to summarize it, I would say, well, Hume really manages to point out that what Descartes thought as a clear set of traits of the Cartesian subject, or we should say at this point of the self or the subject, as having instrumental reason, Hume says, but where does that come from? Why do we do anything in relation to that? You know, like, uh, sure, instrumental reason is something that allows us to see maybe how to attain goals. But why do we act in the first place? Right. What is it that motivates us to act? It's feeling, it's emotions, right? So in some sense, it's really providing a crucial challenge to the Cartesian picture, but it's also at another level, bringing in emotions as part of 
the drive to instrumental reasons and then bringing emotions further inside as they had already been established now. Now Kant tackles this challenge because Kant appreciates Hume's challenge to Descartes and the whole tradition of rationalism in what will obviously become with him and after him empiricism. <coughs> Kant appreciates this challenge and um, Kant is asking himself, okay, like it's become impossible to say that um, we are a subject that then goes out, uses instrumental procedural reason to find regularities and orders in the world. Because Hume has really convincingly offered skeptical argument to say that there are no su there is no such way of attaining knowledge of these regularities and orders and absolute laws in the world. That really, technically speaking, we don't observe causality in the world. Causality is something that is really more like constant conjunction. That Kant's solution in transcendental idealism is to say, well, the world, as it is in itself, we actually can't know it. We always approach it from the perspective of a mind with a set of faculties, internalization of the, you know, the traits of the subject. It has a bunch of different categories, which in the Greeks used to be the categories, especially in Aristotle, that were in nature, substance, accidents, unity, multiplicity, etc., etc. Actually, there are categories of the understanding. They are there are traits of our faculties that we impose in our own, in, in making intelligible and ordering of the world as we experience it. The world as we experience it is already ordered by our mind, by our faculties. What it is behind that, what Kant often refers to as the manifold, we never get to know, right? That was a solution that was very appealing to a lot of philosophers and to this day is very appealing to, you know, a lot of philosophers in the Anonic tradition. It's still, we are still like inheritors of Kant, but there's been, in some ways, you could argue that the rest of Western thought since then has been a series of challenges to Kant. And, you know, I want to maybe conclude with this. I could go on for a long time, but God, it's already 27 minutes and I want to, you know, conclude with this. So first challenge to Kant, of course, Hegel. Hegel argues that if we can't know the world as it is in itself, then why the heck do we posit this world? You know, maybe there is no such world as it is in itself. And what there is is spirit, ghostly kind of thing, you know, thought in its various uh, understandings of itself and developments of itself, leading to complete absolute idealism, right? Idealism, just getting rid of this idea that there's a world that we know in itself. You get Nietzsche who rebels against Kant, not only in terms of uh, this idea that there's a word that is in itself. You know, of course, Nietzsche famously says, there are no facts, only interpretations, leading to this idea of perspectivism. There's multiple perspectives on the world. There's no in itself. Now, that's been massively influential on what is now known as uh, Structuralism, post-structuralism, and post-modernism often accuse of relativism because of this perspectivism. You think that Foucault and Derrida and Deleuze just came out of nowhere? No. They're inheritors of Nietzsche, except that they pushed this much further. Now, Foucault, by showing that the lenses through the pers the lenses through which we experience truth in the world are really the lenses of particular perspectives in an Nietzschean sense, but perspectives that were, are more influential than others because they have power. Perspectives of the government, perspectives of the legal system, perspectives of the hospital, perspectives of the mathematical view of the world, and so on and so forth. There I will say that the perspectives are always contaminated by what, you know, uh, the way in which we write how uh, we relate to the idea of lo logic itself, the logos, logocentrism, uh, phonocentrism, you know, these concepts in there, they are very much linked to the fact that what we think is true is inevitably always infected by a particular perspective that in the West, at least, is what he calls logocentrism, contaminated by this idea that the speech has priority over, over the text and that speech can be something that is transparent and can be immediately given in, in its meaning to the hearer and to the speaker. There it argues that we have to bring it back to the idea of writing and the text and notice that there is always a contamination that takes place and that no concept is completely transparent. 
Now that is way beyond Nietzsche in terms of really looking at the at the at the non-transparency of the subject and of thought. But you can see in it Nietzschean perspectivism in this. I should mention that in this whole process, there's not just Nietzsche, but there's also Freud that has to be mentioned as a massive influence on postmodernism because Freud essentially comes forward and says, hey, you think that is a unified subject? Actually, no. There's at least three different ones. There's at least the superego, the ego, and the id. And in fact, there can be many more in mental illness, in schizophrenia, and so on. And, I mean, Freud saw himself as a scientist, as an empiricist, but he definitely brought a massive blow to this idea that we are pure uh, selves, rational selves, that are able to deploy instrumental reasons in attaining certain goals and our will to align our goals and our goal-orientedness to the moral good. But what's interesting in all this is that we are still animated by a notion of the moral good that is very Kantian and before this, um, monotheistic Christian, Muslim, Judeo-Christian Muslim in it, at least in the West, we do think that uh, it is possible to align rationality and the good. We don't think that being rational simply equates to uh, doing good, but that there is a link, you know. Um, and therefore, postmodernist writing sometimes kind of make us feel weird and we think, oh, nihilism, right? When we say nihilism, we're referring to our inheritance of the moral tradition. So there have been attempts in the 20th century to recover, you know, the, the ethics that were transmitted to us throughout time and the tradition. And this is how you get the works of uh, lots of different, very highly influential moral thinkers. In the 20th century, John Rawls being one important one, uh, you also get the moral thought of Charles Taylor himself, who I mentioned before, who has some slightly more, um, ultimately more Christian perspective. You get the uh, writings of Derek, Derek Parfit, who really brings a challenge to this concept of the unified subject, but is nevertheless really concerned with questions of morality and right action. You get the right work of Bernard Williams, you get the work of Peter Singer, who has this more utilitarian perspective, which again, I'm not going to go into, but is, a, is whose roots in Christianity are really often underestimated. And, you know, if there is an interest in me delving more into these topics, I will do so in the future. But I think that what I want to conclude with is that modernity and, and, and the 20th century, as opposed to pre-modernity, if you like, the one thing that defines it and makes it very hard to talk about it in a unified way, you know, in the section of this video, is that it's defined by plurality, by pluralism. There are still people who are very influenced by the platonic way of looking at things. There are people who are still very, very much influenced by the Cartesian dualism way of looking at things. There is people who are fierce believers in the Kantian universal right kind of approach. There's, of course, Marxists who, whether they know it or not, are influenced by the Hegelian way of looking at things, even though they are making this perspective materialistic. There's postmodernists who are much more influenced by the Nietzschean way of looking at things. And they have somehow to live with each other and to have a dialogue, you know. And so how to make all this work? Well, as some of you might know, I myself espouse these days a position more akin to the post-analytic tradition of Ludwig Wittgenstein and also neo-pragmatism inherited from Quine and Rorty and Donald Davidson. That is fundamentally, you know, uh, the concept of language games, the idea that you have to pay attention to the rules of any language that are played by particular communities. And this idea that um, truth is what people would arrive at in a context of an ideal speech situation in the context of uh, unhindered communication between rational agents, which is also inherited by, from Jürgen Habermas, a highly influential thinker, perhaps the most influential thinker on the construction of the European Union. Um, you know, this is also part of the pragmatic tradition. And I think having thinkers of pluralism is essential in our society. But let me know what you think. And if you especially if you thought that this was uh, an interesting example of an NI perspective where we look at the high level, we see the constants across time and that we try to bring in the big picture.
in this case, a Western thought. And I hope that this video is also enlightening to you uh, intellectually, you know, bringing in my cap as a historian of ideas, at least by training. So let me know what you think in the comments, guys. Hopefully that wasn't too overwhelming and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.